Let's talk about some Lady Shylocks. Oh, look what's coming. Oh. Hey there, hey, handsome. Hey, baby. How are you? Good. Lorraine, you're looking good. Yeah, keeping it together with Pilates and gin. Lorraine Caluso is an associate with the Lupertazzi crime family. It's Lorraine Caluso. Rainy Caluso. We know that Lorraine Caluso knew Carmine going back many years. Little Carmine went to school with her. She and Carmine Jr. had slept together at some point. And same goes for Lorraine and Tony. Yeah, a million years ago. There's nothing a secret. So although we don't hear much about her until we meet her in season five, apparently. Lady Shylock, you got some reputation. Yeah, my mother said that might happen. Never enough body count for Lorraine. Fuck, I'll let her taste her own medicine. I'd like to introduce you to the love of my life. This is my partner, Jason Evanina. Honor to meet you. Hey. So we first meet Lorraine in season five, episode two, Rat Pack, at the funeral for Carmine Sr. She's still got the nice manners, according to Polly. And it appears the gender roles are switched here with her romantic partner, Jason Evanina. We're used to seeing the aggressive wise guy with his generally quieter, more submissive wife, at least in public. But here, Lorraine appears to be the alpha in the relationship. Sorry, we're not open. What, not open? A man in your position turn away fucking business now. I didn't know it was you, Lorraine. Phil, hey, I was just thinking about you. Those Islander tickets, right? How about this humidity? But along with this alpha, strong personality, can come trouble, as we see in multiple occasions throughout The Sopranos. And with Lorraine, it's no exception. After Carmine Sr. dies, Johnny Sack wants to quickly cement, no pun intended, his position as the next boss of the Lupertazzi family. But Lorraine doesn't start kicking up to him. Mm -mm. She's still giving that money to Carmine, little Carmine. Potential. They almost killed us. Jason, men are talking here. Johnny Sack tells Tony that there's never a high enough body count for Lorraine. Let her taste her own medicine. But we really don't see that in practice. In fact, we only see Johnny's high body count tallying up. So, I just wanted to throw that in. Unfortunately for Lorraine, those Islanders tickets aren't going to deter people like Philly Atardo, who support Johnny Sack, from kicking the shit out of her and threatening to kill her, if she doesn't start kicking up to Johnny Sack. Narrator. But she didn't start kicking up to Johnny Sack. You were warned, Lorraine. The money goes up to John. Next time? There'll be no next time. So we saw next time. Does Lorraine crawling on the floor remind you of anyone? For me, it's Adriana. Look how similar it looks when she's crawling on the ground, trying to get away from Sill. The last time we see her is Season 5, Episode 4, All Happy Families, which is when she's killed. So, we don't know her for that long, but she has quite a reputation. On the other hand, when it comes to the intercontinental grapevine, Tony's less up to speed on those arrangements. In Season 2, Episode 4, Commendatory, Tony, Polly, and Christopher make a trip to Italy, to Naples, to be specific to do some business. Tony thinks he's going to meet the boss, sit down face to face, talk business. But when he sees the boss, he's surprised to see her. Annalisa is the boss of a crime family based in Naples, Italy. Tony thinks that Z Vittorio is the boss, but when he arrives, he finds out that the actual boss, my husband, fuck you. He's never coming back. So you have to fucking deal with me. Annalise is in charge. <laughs> a fucking woman, boss. Our men kill each other. Rome has a war against us. But our men are in love to their mama, huh? Why do you save your toenail clippings? Let's talk about the nail. Annalisa tells Tony that if your enemy comes into possession of your nail or your hair clippings, they can make the evil on you. Fast forward, season four, episode eight, mergers and acquisitions. Look who finds a nail on Tony's clothes. Yep, Carmella. 
It's Valentina's now, though. I just want your undivided attention for once. Is it so much to fucking ask for a little bit of attention? Ah! Anyway, getting back to Annalisa. Tony wants guys that'll be loyal to him and only him, 110%. Like Furio. Tony seems pretty impressed with how Annalisa can act as the boss while also taking care of the children, the house, her father who's elderly. Whereas with him, on the other side over here, it's like agita, 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 agita all the time. When Annalisa talks to Tony about how their whole family lives together, she says, what am I going to do, send my father to hospice? And I think that Tony, right at that moment, thinks about Livia. There's this one scene with Annalisa and Tony where she's showing him around the area and giving him kind of a little tour of history. And she really puts in perspective for Tony just how little and insignificant and trivial we really are in the context of history. And how there's so many people that came before us, there will be people that come after us. And really, when we think about it, we're just a tiny, tiny speck in the grand scheme of everything. And we come back to this later, actually, when someone else goes back overseas. This time it's Carmela and Rosalie, and they're in Paris, but very similar concepts. The city is so old. You think about all the people who've lived here, generation after generation, hundreds and hundreds of years, all those lives. Delivering unto them their fates. I couldn't help but think of Tony and mafia bosses in general, when he says delivering them their fates. Because that's what the boss often does. He chooses who lives, who dies. You are your own worst enemy. When Annalisa tells Tony that he's his own worst enemy, and he tells her that she reminds him of someone back in the States, he's referring to Dr. Melfi. But I don't shit where I eat. But he does sometimes let horses shit where he eats. As Carmela mentions later on. You can't have your horse in here. Why not? Are you kidding me? The smell and shit all over the place? I'll clean up after her. You always say that. So of course, this whole thing blows up with Furio. He goes back to Italy apparently, leaves a message at the bang at 4 a.m. If we take all that at face value, okay. Now Furio's back in Italy. We don't hear anything else from Annalisa. Now I imagine if Furio just disappeared and didn't end up back in Italy, Annalisa would eventually wonder where he was or wonder what was going on. But none of that becomes relevant. So to wrap things up, here are these two women. One's in the United States, one's in Italy. They're both involved in organized crime very different personalities as we can see but i think it's important to highlight them because when we think of women of the sopranos too often and understandably so we just think of the wives and the gumars the ones that are kind of in the background just making sure that there's food on the table and clean clothes in the closet but there are more than that and these two ladies are a great example thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed this video on annalisa and lorraine caluso What'd you think? Let me know.